based in Mumbai. Welcome, ma'am, and over to you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you, Vibhuti, for having me on this panel. <coughs> I'm very happy to be here. This has been my main work, and I've written extensively on this about uh, the women's movement and how it has fought for uh, uh, legal changes and uh, legislative reforms. So right from 1980, this has been the focus uh, of every issue that was taken up by the women's movement. Uh, firstly, the anti-rape uh, law uh, amendment to the rape law. In 1983, it came and uh, it widened the scope and uh, brought in certain important changes in law, uh, particularly increase in punishment, uh, um, seven years for ordinary rapes and 10 years for aggravated rapes, and also uh, brought in a, a broader definition about rape, etc. So this was the beginning, and it provided a blueprint for us to follow in the years to come. Uh, and the government was uh, receptive and uh, our demands were met at that time. Uh, but whether it cha brought changes on the ground is another question. And we still feel, we feel even today, the changes are not implemented at all. The second one was about dowry and dowry related legislation. So we got a new, uh, in 84, uh, the earlier law, dowry law was amended and the most stringent punishment was prescribed. <clears throat> and then in 1986, we got the uh, amendment to uh, uh, IPC and brought in 498A. Now this 498A has become very controversial and there is a lot of allegation that women are misusing it. But I believe that a lot of uh, women don't even know this law and they're not using this at all. Uh, but uh, this law has uh, uh, the provision of immediate arrest. And that is what people are objecting to, that you file a false case and there is immediate arrest. So you have to uh, run for anticipatory bail. So these are the general misgivings about this law. But according to me, it is a very small section of uh, urban upper class uh, uh, women, but a large section of our uh, rural women or even urban women from the lower class are not able to access justice. So there's so much of domestic violence there, but uh, there are very few cases of 498 actually filed. And now the police, even if you go to the police station, the police uh, refused uh, to file cases. So these are important uh, changes in law that brought about. Then there was, there is a uh, changes in the uh, trafficking law. Uh, trafficking of minors, trafficking of children, etc. Uh, there's also uh, similarly the punishment was increased, uh, and uh, also there is uh, there is the <coughs> obscenities prevention act uh, that was also introduced around this time. So basically, uh, all the issues taken up by the women's movement ended in uh, legislative reforms. Now, what did these reforms actually do? So uh, mainly they made the law more deterrent. By deterrent, I mean increase in punishment. So uh, the punishment was increased in every case that was taken up. And uh, the law became uh, very strict once the case is filed. But in mo most uh, instances, the cases are never filed. So uh, uh, even in rape law, the cases are not filed. Now the rape law went through many, many amendments. Um, many, many changes over the years from 1983 onwards. And the more recent one is that after the so-called Nirbhaya case uh, of Jyoti Pandey, again, we got the law reform and uh, where certain clarifications have come that consent has to be voluntary. We can't just assume consent. A lack of protest is not consent. That somebody did not resist is not consent. and. Uh, uh, so now we have the 2013 uh, amendment to the rape law, uh, which was uh, which came about after the such a recommendations by the Burma committee. So this is where we stand today. But even today, it's not easy to file a rape case, and the procedure is very very difficult. The earlier speakers must have spoken about the difficulties and challenges you meet in court. 
According to me, uh, where the women's movement faltered was while stringent punishment was asked and the statutory reforms were uh, they got. But we didn't look at uh, procedure. How does one access the courts? How do you go to court? What are the mechanisms into which uh, access to justice is provided? So these issues did not get due attention at that time. But in the Domestic Violence Case Act, uh, the whole procedure has made, um, been made, uh, a lot of attention has been um, uh, introduced and particularly regarding the statute, uh, regarding the procedure. So this, uh, with this, you, you have several sections, you don't need a lawyer, a very wide definition of domestic violence, is provided verbal violence, economic violence, physical violence, sexual violence, etc. has come into it. And there's certain protection. It is not just criminalization, but it is protective legislation that uh, if you file under the, this act, you can ask for civil remedies. So it's a criminal act, but also civil act. So here the remedies are uh, that you need to, uh, you need to, uh, you have a right to stay in the matrimonial home, uh, custody of children, maintenance, etc., which were there in uh, different personal laws, but they've all come together in the Domestic Violence Act. So here it is the wide definition uh, using uh, uh, abusive language, uh, physical, physical assault, of course, sexual assault, of course, but even other things like throwing her out of the house, using abusive language, all of them have been made uh, uh, offenses. And you can ask for remedy, and you can ask for civil remedy. So this has been extremely useful, and uh, uh, this has been extremely useful, and uh, a lot of people are using this. Not sufficient uh, people, but at least the preventive action has helped a lot. Uh, so this is the Domestic Violence Act, which came in 2005, and uh, a simple application to the court is sufficient. And the format is given in the act itself. Uh, you don't need a lawyer. An NGO person can also represent you. And so the uh, expenses of spending on a lawyer is cut out. And uh, you can get immediate remedy. This is all on paper. Actually, when you go to court, it is as difficult, but maybe slightly easier than before. Uh, ra rather than yeah, filing a, going to police station and filing a criminal complaint, you can directly go, go to court with a simple application, either yourself or help by an NGO or help by a legal aid lawyer, etc. And just mention the instances of violence and take uh, security protection. <clears throat> this is not a law uh, which gives you a divorce, but it gives you other protective measures. So this is important of the Domestic Violence Act. And the women's movement had to struggle for nearly two decades to get this. Uh, act because it is so complicated. Uh, it is a combination of civil and uh, uh, criminal uh, uh, remedies. And uh, so uh, uh, we are greatly benefited by this act. I don't know other speakers must, may have spoken about it, but I also feel that uh, it is of great importance uh, that uh, this act has come about in 2005. Now we are in 2023. But even then, a lot of people are not aware of it. Uh, so this is the Domestic Violence Act. And if you study this act, then in the procedure, which is given very simply and very easily understandable language is used here. And that is the benefit of this particular act. So we are very happy with this act. Of course, the magistrates, it is supposed to be very short. Uh, within a short time, you have to get your remedies. Uh, but uh, the courts are overclocked and uh, dates are long dates are given. So it is not being implemented as it was originally envisaged. But even then, it is better situation than earlier because you go to magistrate court. You don't go to civil court. Civil court is more expensive. Magistrate court is simpler. Application is also simple. Uh, NGOs can also file. Legal aid lawyer can also represent you. So the litigation cost is reduced. And the simple procedure helps you. So uh, Majlis has been using this uh, law a lot, particularly for women who are coming 
most women who come are in an abusive marriage situation. There's a lot of domestic violence there. And instead of filing straight away for divorce, uh, we file under this act and ask for maintenance or custody or most important right of residence that he cannot threaten her to throw her out. Uh, so this is the Domestic Violence Act. Uh, but I just want to say a little bit on the uh, question of uniform civil code. Now we have a uniform civil code uh, issue, which is simmering. And uh, <clears throat> the law commission in uh, 2018 brought out a, uh, brought, brought out a report. Uh, that is the 21st law commission which said that uh, a uniform civil code is neither uh, necessary nor required at this stage. Uh, but they made a lot of uh, recommendations to make personal laws gender just, equitable. I agree that personal laws have a lot of discrimination against women. They are feudal in nature and women are given a subordinate position. So I'm not defending the gender unjust laws, I'm only uh, pointing out the mechanism into which we can rectify this without going into this whole debate or controversy regarding the Uniform Civil Code. This happened in 2018, August 31st, the report was brought out by the uh, 21st Law Commission. But in uh, last month, in uh, June 13, 14, uh, the 22nd Law Commission again asked for opinions uh, on the Uniform Civil Code. And our Prime Minister, when we're speaking in Bhopal to the grassroots workers, uh, he uh, made a plea for the Uniform Civil Code. Now, what is our objection? Our objection is that the entire focus here is anti-Muslim. The entire focus is to divide the community. The entire focus is to control population. So uh, uh, take out polygamy. I'm not saying any of them should be allowed. I'm only saying that uh, by doing this in this manner, just before the election, the political intention becomes very clear. It's not just a question of legal rights or women's rights. There's also a political agenda beneath this. I'm saying this because uh, all the experts, many experts have said this also. Uh, the 2018 report had lots of suggestions, small, small, small suggestions to make the law gender equitable, to bring in, uh, take out discrimination and uh, to make it gender just. In 2018 to 2023, the government did not do, bring in a single amendment. And that is very sad part of it. And suddenly they woke up and said, now we need uniform civil court to bring in gender justice. So the PM's talk is entirely on Muslim community and saying that um, uh, the Muslim law is backward, Muslim community is backward, uh, and vested interests are uh, uh, influencing uh, the Muslim community leader, leaders against the uniform civil court, et cetera. Thereby implying that everything is uh, 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 perfect with the Hindu law. And Hindu law is progressive. Now, this whole one uh, law, one nation theory, according to me, is very um, detrimental. There is a fear among the minorities that is, is going towards building one nation, one law, uh, towards building a Hindu Rashtra. So what is the, when we say law commission is asking for opinion, the 22nd law commission, the law commission has not uh, introduced a draft at all. They will, uh, they are working on it, in fact. Uh, but in one stroke to take out all personal laws is not, uh, is not feasible in our country. There are so many tribal cultures who are uh, following their own uh, religion. And if there is a lot of opposition to it, it will not be uh, uh, agreed upon by minorities as well as uh, by uh, these communities or the states, entire states who have exemption, constitutional exemption under 371, for instance, 371A, 371 g etc., where uh, the personal laws are preserved and there is a local uh, council which has to approve just because the center is brought in law, it does not apply to them. And already there is unrest. Already uh, people have said that uh, uh, 
uh, we are, the entire state is dead like Mizoram, Nagaland, uh, saying that we are interfering with the tribal customs. Now, are there uh, tribal customs gender judge? Some have matrilineal uh, traditions, some are patriarchal, some uh, uphold women's rights, and some don't. But is this the way to go about it? Is this the easy way out of the situation? So this is uh, problematic. And this is why uh, Madhis has worked very strongly, feels very strongly about this. And we have collected a lot of signatures. And a lot of people are opposed to this. And uh, they are. this entire thing is going to be sent to the law minister uh, or the law commission uh, very soon, like in a day or two, and will be sent out uh, with all the signatures of people uh, of uh, informed people, uh, of people who are well aware of it, the judges there who have endorsed, a lot of legal experts have uh, uh, enforced, and we are in the process of finalizing this. So this is our uh, concern today, that uniform law will divide the community. Uh, the objection here is the entire slogan one, uh, nation one law, uh, uh, and that law is, there's a fear, it will be a Hindu law and it will go towards building the Hindu Rashtra. There's also this whole concern that Muslim polygamy is uh, increasing population of Muslims. And Muslims will soon overtake Hindus. This is another fear among the people which is whipped up. And here uh, the Hindus are about 80%. Muslims are around 14%. So it's sort of absurd that uh, Muslim population, uh, if there is no UCC, uh, Muslim population will overtake the Hindu population. It's an absurd uh, connotation, but Hindus get very easily swayed by it. And uh, they, that's why they endorse the uh, UCC. In fact, there is active campaign and a letter has been uh, circulated saying that a draft is circulated. I support the UCC because of this, because of this, because of this. I also have received this. And there are adverse uh, propaganda material that are being circulated. And the Law Commission has said that they have received about 20 lakh responses. Uh, so how do these uh, responses come? From where do these responses come? Who is manipulating this? So this is some real concern. And uh, if the prime ministers are uh, spitted for this, and the Law Commission is also going to uh, be a so-called opinion of the people, etc. Uh, so uh, it is sort of imminent that uh, they're saying that in the monsoon session only uh, uh, a draft will be submitted, etc. Right now we are asking, uh, law commission is asking for opinion without a draft. There's nothing to respond to. And so legal experts have said you don't have to respond because nothing to respond to. But uh, if you don't respond, then they'll say you agree. So in order to show your opposition, there has to be uh, an, uh, a letter written to the law commission oppose that you are opposing this. So this is where we stand. And uh, so I've covered uh, issues like the uh, legislative reforms uh, of the 80s and more recently the uh, amendment, etc. I've also covered the issue of uh, uh, Domestic Violence Act how it has helped, which has got both criminal and civil uh, remedies, uh, and it is easier to access the courts. And I've also touched upon the Uniform Civil Code and our resistance to that, our opposition to that, and how it is important to express our opinion and write letters to the Law Commission. This time is very less. They have given one month from the 14th of July. So by 13th of July, your uh, reply has to go. So I urge all of you to write to Law Commission and express your opinion and say that you, if you really believe in what I say, uh, say you oppose the Domestic Violence Act, uh, uh, the Uniform Civil Code, and uh, you will uh, uh, you will uh, support the 21st Law Commission report and uh, agree to changes within personal laws. It's my request to you. Have any questions? I will answer them. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, ma'am, for your such an enlightening and insightful session. Now I request the chair, Professor Vibhuti, to share her remarks. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, 
related issues you have raised my i have two questions one is about population and also i think uh, uh, the role of caste panchayats we all have uh, like uh, 30000 customary laws and uh, as per the schedule 5 of the constitution of india we have 645 distinct tribes in our country so uh, when they said that uh, northeastern states will be consulted before uh, any legal reforms in customary or or uniform civil but what about that we have tribal population throughout the country plus we have khap panchayats and we have caste panchayats how will they uh, uh, this thing come under the purview of ucc because some of the caste panchayats are extremely powerful in haryana rajasthan uh, punjab uh, even uh, gujarat so how, how would they reconcile with the uniform civil code the leaders of the caste panchayats see nothing is known right now and i agree with you uh, the local uh, tribes and uh, their caste panchayats and uh, uh, tribal ka <coughs> formations are very very strong yeah. and they are also not gender just there is a lot of uh, injustice to women happening there yeah. so we need to address that yeah the government has to work very concretely in addressing such uh, uh, discrimination against women so how the ucc is going to help that i am not aware because we don't have a draft so uh, how it will be implemented and what is the uh, mechanism through which it will be brought about that is not known today and i agree with you that uh, hindu uh, law itself it when the hindu law. court bill was passed it gave exemption to customary practices for marriage okay. and for divorce okay. uh, for polygamy also so if your custom accepts and court also said the custom accepts it uh, that tribal custom or caste con- uh, concern even your marriage uh, situation is either is a brahmanical or based on caste so uh, either it is you have to do saptapadi uh, the seven uh, feras round the uh, fire and kanyadan or you have to follow the tribal custom so now in such a situation that you bring in a uniform civil code Uh, who is going to follow this and one point i missed is the hindu undivided family property uh, where women are not given uh, property rights uh, now recently there have been uh, some amendments to this but even then the girls are forced to, to give their signature yeah. uh, and give the property to, to the brother at the time of the marriage itself and they are told that you are given dowry so now you don't have property rights so this is the system so how are we going to tackle this yeah and how the uniform civil code is going to tackle this these are some important questions that we need to address yeah i think even that's why i think um, even among the hindus it's not a only muslims question because yesterday also it came out that even in north eastern countries even after 40 years of efforts by feminists like jarjum they said we could not uh, bring reforms in the polygamy it is rampant even in uh, the her state no arunachal pradesh and other thing is that uh, when it comes to officials in certain states have circulated gr Uh, requesting brothers not to allow their sisters to tie rakhi unless they give it in writing that they don't want share in property imagine the official gr was sent last year at the time of rakhi in rajasthan later on it was withdrawn after the protest and all but this is the level of uh, patriarchal uh, control no over women get, women's entitlements no? yeah so it's it's going to create lot of problem now it's not only among the muslims but i think other communities and other religious groups are also going to be very very uh, what you call insecure and also uh, I, we haven't seen their statements but i think there must be a lot of churning going on at the, amongst them also yeah mm-hmm. so wow jarjum was in support of the ucc no she says that it's going to the, the circumstances they said during 80s we were saying that we want gender just uh, laws family laws but we know that the, how it is intertwined with the uh, uh, identity politics and in current context political context it's going to be very detrimental there should be reform from within 
that community should come out. No, and it, it is happening. She gives several examples here of Arunachal Pradesh, where so many uh, women, individual women, groups, such say Commission for Women had also prepared a draft, which was there was tremendous opposition from various tribal leaders because all the tribal councils in Arunachal Pradesh are male dominated. They don't have women's representation. So they said this kind of a debates and churning is going on in in at the state level. No. But that should be like democratic process, people's involvement, opinion to so it's on. You just can't impose it from center. No, that was the feeling. Yeah. So reforms from within. Thank you, ma'am. And I request advocate Dr. Shalunagam to share her remarks. Yeah. Uh, before that, I just want to say one thing. Yeah. Uh, I written this article in Indian Express a uh, long time ago, just as this debate started. Okay. And I very strongly said that you bring in the reforms with the 2018 uh, law commission, uh, 21st law commission had recommended. Okay. And uh, in four years, the government did not do anything at all. Now that, according to me, should be the way. Uh, while we agree that uh, personal laws are patriarchal, they are framed in the feudal times, and uh, they, are, um, they make women subordinates, and we need to change it. We need to bring two val newer values into this. But how the process, yeah. as I said, even about our legislative uh, reforms, the process is becoming very important mm -hmm. rather than what outcome it is giving. So yeah. here also, it is very strongly felt that reform within community should come and not yeah. uh, imposed from above a uh, uniform. Yeah. So this okay. is our concern here. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you for such an illuminating, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, your words. Like you have always been inspiration for you know people like like me. That you know your your work is like you know I've been reading all your uh, articles and your books and other things. But just uh, you know one thing since you talked about domestic violence law and the rape law and but the manner in, in which it is implemented because uh, uh, we all know that the problems women face in access to justice and but by the time the court uh, the, uh, the the cases reach to the high court or to the supreme court uh, what we have seen is that sometimes you get a very uh, you know kind of uh, uh, anti women kind of judgments where the, the, the high courts have said okay uh, the, the rapist can you know should be tied rocky and you know they, uh, if the victim and the accused are get, getting married you know they, they could be the case could be resolved uh, or maybe the Anish uh, you know Kumar uh, judgments which talks about you know the women are liars and uh, all the cases are false and something like that so you know how to uh, deal with this kind of and even the home ministry have uh, you know issued a lot of uh, you know uh, notifications time to time about uh, diluting the these kind of laws especially the 498 and we have seen that dory law is not yet being implemented at the ground level it's there on the paper for, for so many decades but not being implemented so um, you know how should we proceed uh, you know, in that direction, you know, so, uh, like, you know, since you, like, you know, a lot of efforts have been made to, to make, make these laws, and now we are, we are seeing that phase that these laws are uh, getting implemented in the court. So how should, like, you know, how should we proceed about that? I agree with you a lot. Um, there's supposed to be uh, judicial academies and a lot of training for judges starts right at the Supreme Court level, to High Court level, to Sessions Court judges, etc. But the thing is, it doesn't work because there is no, no monitoring once the training is given. And some, sometimes the trainers themselves are very patriarchal in their viewpoint. Particularly if, if I say something and the Supreme Court uh, judge says something else against what I have said, then the judges are likely to accept what the Supreme Court judge says because that's their training, uh, their superiors, etc. And I'm an outsider. So uh, my uh, saying something has no value. So this is where we are stuck. And particularly an adverse judgment has come. Then uh, it becomes very popular. Even the uh, newspapers discuss it. Everybody is aware of it. Uh, adverse publicity is given. So uh, all the judges know about it. The positive aspects, they don't know because it's never been talked about in the press. So that is the difficulty in which we are facing. And uh, according to me, only uh, positive judgments 
of the high court and supreme court will matter and only those can bring in changes uh, and but if the negative judgments come in between and then that wipes out all the gains and that's where we are and statutorily how do you monitor the judges uh, there is no provision to monitor the judges at all because they have absolutely uh, freedom to uh, read the law assess the facts and give their judgment they have to be free thinking uh, so in that um, women support so legal awareness according to me is the only thing at the higher level of the judiciary people of course at the lower level ngos etc need to be trained but that is subsequent the primary thing is to uh, change the mindset of the judges so that negative judgments don't come nikita back to you thank you uh, the floor is now open for questions from the audience i uh, mean while i have a question ma'am uh, with regard to ucc uh, since both the laws are very patriarchal in nature so i would like you to elaborate on the uh, 21st finance uh, law commission report uh, like what measures were suggested uh, to make these personal laws gender just you know the, uh, it looked uh, it's a very comprehensive uh, report of 100, 185 pages it looked at all uh, uh, personal laws particularly dealt with property rights and talked about a hindu undivided family property and also discrimination under a special marriage act a parsi marriage um, christian marriage all marriages so for instance uh, if a parsi marries woman marries uh, outside the community she loses rights in a parental property so this is such discrimination must go men and she, she, uh, women should have equal rights to property inheritance similarly uh, the lots uh, of had i don't remember all of them but uh, the main point here was inheritance laws of the hindus that rights of property must go um and uh, i want to add to that it was not said in the report because issues of bigamy and uh, by polygamy etc were before the uh, parliament or the supreme court adultery 497 etc were before the supreme court so the law commission said i will we will not address those because the supreme court or the uh, parliament can uh, decide on this <coughs> but even so uh, we feel that uh, that has to go and then there are like many other about child custody child guardianship maintenance to women uh, inheritance all uniform law should be there even among the muslims shias and sunnis have different uh, uh, laws uh, christian among the christians if a widow doesn't have children a childless widow uh, gets only half the husband's uh, property the rest goes to husband's relative so such things are there very minor things are there in that report and uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, adoption also they said uniform uh, laws should be applied and some communities don't have uh, adoption <clears throat> so everybody should have equal rights uh, of adoption adopting children <clears throat> as well as the custody issue at the time of divorce and one important thing that the 2018 law commission report brought out is division of matrimonial property this is very basic and uh, uh, important because right now we have only right of maintenance uh for women at the time of divorce and none of the personal laws have anything about um uh, matrim- division of matrimonial property now we had majlis has been demanding this for a long time and we also drafted a bill about uh, division of matrimonial property but it's such a complex issue what happens to dowry who gets to keep it uh <clears throat> what do we share how much do we share do we share the matrimonial home uh, yeah. do we share ha- husband's uh, share in the huf property all these questions came up and uh, it was very difficult to find an answer we circulated the bill and it was discussed also but because of all these things and the um, government changed and the new commission came so after that we did not pursue it but this is what the law commission report says 2018 and um, we need to follow this so we need to see also in the ucc bill how they have dealt with this that uh, division of uh, matrimonial property is not there in any person at the moment 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll now take up other questions. Kumari Dikshita has raised her hand. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, ma'am, I have a doubt that uh, regarding UCC implementation, even if the UCC demand is currently based on religion and against, you know, increasing Muslim uh, population, but isn't it uh, good for women's rights plus gender justice, etc.? Because if we register our protest against it right now, uh, kind of demand will emerge in the future because uh, often we hear that it is better, you know, to strike out when iron is hot. So then, so what uh, you have, you know, want to say about that? Can you just repeat, please? Ma'am, isn't it uh, good for the women's rights and gender justice, etc., if the UCC is uh, being implemented right now, even if we know that it is, you know, uh, right now its demand is totally dependent upon the religion and against Muslims increasing population. Okay. Uh, see, but what are you agreeing for? You have no idea about it. So you are agreeing blindly that, uh, yeah, I want uniform civil code. So, but are they going to touch the Hindu law? Are they going to uh, do away with the joint pro property? Are they going to introduce matrimonial property? What are the uh, principles upon which they will bring in all this? So these are the important concerns. What about child custody? Will single women get uh, child custody? Uh, yeah, adoption rights, etc. Uh, at the time of divorce, how do you separate? How do you how do you find the child custody issue to be settled? So these are some of the important concerns for us. So uh, we can't say blindly that it is good for women. Uh, and uh, we need to like uh, look at it in more detail and uh, find out where the problems are and how to solve them. I'm not saying they're good. I am saying that we need to address them separately, not necessarily going into the debate of UCC. Peta. Ma'am, I have a question regarding how women's rights are impact in our neighboring countries. Now, for example, in the Middle East, we have the guardianship law in Saudi Arabia. Um, so, uh, and even the uh, recent uh, uh, ban upliftment of uh, women uh, having their having rights to drive cars. So, this has this uh, reform, I think, uh, or policy in place has um, impacted women's. Uh, mobility and overall rights. So uh, my question is, is um, how uh, how does this impact, um, uh, you know, uh, is, I mean, how does this impact uh, the overall uh, women's uh, rights, like um, the guardianship law in uh, Saudi Arabia and with focus in India? So how, how does this impact? I'm not very aware of, this, uh, uh, of the uh, Arab countries and how their laws are implemented. Uh, my work is here only and I have uh, only dealt with the Indian laws. And here, uh, according to me, are the problem areas and we need to uh, address them as, as they come up here in our situation. So uh, there have been changes in the Muslim personal law, for instance, uh, 1986, uh, uh, the right upon divorce, uh, 19, uh, more recently, the law uh, uh, legislation that was brought up in 2022, uh, where uh, right upon marriage uh, has uh, uh, been uh, brought in for Muslims. So, uh, and uh, if a husband gives the law, he can be imprisoned. So, these are some of the laws that have come up in India. So, uh, so I am, I like, for instance, to give you a simple uh, example. In Karnataka, women's travel is free. And that has liberated women so much that they can go anywhere in the bus, bus ride, and uh, no, there are no ticket for them. So simple, instead of going to like Saudi Arabia, you can just go here in India and see what are the advantages. Simple thing, nothing to do with law, but the government policy. So how this policy actually helped women's mobility and their uh, ability to tra travel. So these are like very uh, simple things that can help at the policy level 
uh, grant women freedom freedom of movement. Um, so we have such things we have to look at and support them as uh, policy level decisions, uh, which will strengthen women's empowerment. Uh, we're talking about uh, Saudi Arabia and the women's uh, given the women uh, to drive, but I'm talking about simple bus travel in India. So these are uh, we need to look at uh, policy level how it is impacted gender justice. So not only personal laws, but even other policy level decisions are impacting women's um, women's empowerment uh, generally. And also, ma'am, um, in in hindsight, uh, for which states in India can we uh, sort of uh, look for a more progressive progressive women rights um, for policy changes and so on and so forth? Which states in in India can we anticipate such progressive women's rights? Well, uh, mostly we have uh, sent, uh, dealt with central legislations. Uh, Statewise legislations we have not gone into. Uh, and uh, all I know is that tribal communities and certain states like Nagaland and Mizoram have objected to the Uniform Civil Code. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I don't know which state, but you have to look at the statewise index uh, of uh, women's empowerment. Uh, and uh, maybe Vibhuti can pitch in here to say which state is uh, better. But there's a general feeling that uh, North Indian states tend to be more patriarchal than South Indian states. South Indian uh, states give more empowerment to women and women's mobility. Uh, this much is a very general statement, but uh, state-wise we need to see look, different parameters are there, like dowry death cases, 498A cases, um, divorce cases, uh, whether they have property rights, uh, whether they're accessing more property rights, and uh, uh, these things we need to look at. Over and above what Flavia has said, I think there are other indicators also, like participation in elected uh, electoral bodies and position like Pradhan and mayor and all. So for, from that point of view, I think Kerala is the best. Uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, uh, Karnataka, Telangana and uh, Andhra Pradesh. They are much, much ahead uh, when it comes to even Goa, when it comes to progressive laws, uh, especially at the ground level as uh, you, Goa is the only state where you have a, a Goa Children's Act, no? which is so important. Uh, so that is there. Another thing is that the utilization of government funds, whatever is gender responsive budgeting to reduce the five uh, gender gap in five areas of education, health, employment, political participation, and combating gender-based violence. In that also, uh, certain states have a better record. And uh, when it comes to Nirbhaya Fund, it is northeastern states which are excellent because there are states after states and union territories. There is a 100% non-utilization. In fact, there is a very comprehensive article in Sunday Review which shows the state-wise uh, how much utilization has taken place. So from 2013, we had 1,000 rupees allocated to combat gender-based violence. But states have not sent proposals. So that is a major uh, this thing. So political arena when it comes to the educational profile also women in beyond arts and science no like ba b com say beyond uh, professional courses there also you see uh, parents spending money on daughters professional education even those indicators they are they are better in the states below india chal those who are above India, even the middle class and upper class, it is said that they will be very hospitable. They may give you one big uh, glass of lassi, as, as one bureaucrat said, free of charge if you go as a hospitality. But ask them to pay 30 rupees uh, fees for daughter's education, they will not. And uh, so I think that this kind of a cultural differences where value of daughter, uh, that is much more found in the Western India and uh, not Rajasthan, but at least uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra and the Southern state. But now Human Development Report 2002 and Human Development Report 2012, both of them have given this gender development index, gender empowerment measure, they call it GEM. So GEM are also given state-wise according to all these criteria of these five important gaps. No? All right. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I have two questions. First, what is the reason behind these uh, this difference uh, among the southern part of the states and the northern part of the states? The value of the daughter is more 
uh, below the Vindhyanchal, as you mentioned. And one que other question is, uh, the violence against women is pervasive across the country, be it sexual violence, domestic violence, or physical violence. Uh, so how can, we curb it? how can we address the root cause of the problem? Uh, like We always say that the root cause is patriarchy. So how do we actually uh, transition that mind from changing the mindset of people? Uh, how to actually uh, address it in uh... Vivid, you want to answer this? Yes, I want to answer. First, and see, there are ethnographers and anth anthropologists, historians uh, who have written extensively on why this much of cultural difference. First, they say that northern states had experienced for invasion by the foreign uh, rulers throughout like the last uh, 1200 years while certain states they, they went up to Vindhyachal. Certain states never experienced invasion of foreign rules and that is why the question of seg segregation of women, custom of parda, uh, uh, killing of daughters, female infanticide, this is not the cultural legacy which Dravid culture had and it is also Aryan. Aryan culture was influ very extremely influential in the northern states which was not the case for northeast as well as southern states. So culturally that is the legacy like there was never the covering the head or segregating women, women not going out or this kind of things were historically not their caste system was there but uh, the, the segregation of women uh, into domesticity and the parda and no role in public life, that has not been the historical legacy of uh, certain states. So that's, that's a Dravid culture also, which was far more egalitarian than the Aryan culture. So that is one explanation they have. And then question, second question was about, what was your question? Hello? How yeah. do we actually bring about the change in uh, mindset? Correct. So, so, so patriarchy operates differently in a different socio-cultural context. No, so the you have to have a look specific understanding of patriarchy. The way Aruna Roy and Nikhil they explained the case of Rajasthan. In Rajasthan, what are the cultural legacy? What are the most important issues of female infanticide or uh, abandonment of uh, this thing or uh, in the name of culture inducting them into process uh, sex work and all so knowing the local problem and the level of uh, subordination and the control over women's sexuality fertility labor you have to create your intervention strategy in collaboration with the people so you can't have a one particular we need central legislations but at the same time we also need a space specific intervention why you do we have which killing only in 14 states. It's not there in all Indian states. Women being dubbed as a witch and killed. So then you have to have anti-witchcraft law in that particular witch killing, uh, witch hunting law in, in the areas where such practices are going on, where you have a very strong institutionalized untouchability. Then you have to make uh, 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 Atrocities Act far more sharper and, implement, uh, and see to it that it is implemented. So I think specificity, knowing the geographical location and the historical legacy and the cultural practices of people, we have to come. Like crimes in the name of honor, they are not happening everywhere. There are certain pockets where when the young lovers, they fall in love with each other, they are being killed by their own family members. So I think we need to address the issue knowing the local reality and come up with a specific intervention strategy. And the honor killings, for instance, uh, happens in uh, many ways. Uh, one is uh, intercaste, intercommunity, interreligion. Secondly, the norms of not marrying your close relative. Uh, uh, seven, um, seven, Sapinda, or uh, three okay. generations, etc. Uh, and if you fall in love with somebody close relative, like a brother, uh, I mean, assumed to be brother, and then again, there is honor killing on this. So uh, we have to understand this culture and traditions. And we have to also look whether in the South you have uh, any of these killings uh, or uh, it's only in the certain Northern states. So all these are indicators for us to understand uh, the uh, the status of the girl child or the status of women in these uh, uh, areas. And uh, as we all know that uh, particularly North Indian states are uh, very anti-women, more patriarchal in their uh, approach towards women. And hence, the uh, the infant killing, uh, girl child, finding out the fetus of the girl child and about uh, leading to abortion, 
uh, most of these practices have prevailed to a very high degree in uh, North India and not so much in Gujarat. Uh, Gujarat is there, but uh, suicides by married women, etc. But Maharashtra and the southern states. Yeah. No, but the problem is that even among the warrior caste, like the highest number of caste, if you see NCRB data, highest number of inter-caste marriages in which people are killed is in Tamil Nadu. And that is among the warrior caste, certain warrior caste, this thing. And now increasingly the children in schools and colleges and workplaces are meeting each other. No, So inter-caste marriages are also increasing in number and the atrocity is also increasing. So because there is more freedom to women. Uh, wherever they are, and they are also taking their own decisions, no? So that is also there. But mostly it is the warrior caste, uh, Jats, Vespots, this thing, where this uh, question of endogamy is so pronounced, and uh, elite also, because uh, it is also linked with the concentration and centralization of property and assets. So if your daughter marries outside, then it is going to create division in the property. In fact, that's what was told when we did the survey on sex selective abortion. It was in ex southern Bombay, so South Bombay, which did not want a single girl. I mean, there this were nursing homes in South Bombay had an extremely adverse uh, child sex ratio at birth. So the nursing home, there, there were 1,011 children, boys, 2,000 girls. No? So that was the level of skewedness. And when we asked the super rich people in Mumbai, they said, we don't want any daughter because if our Jawai will ask for a share in property. And we have built our empire with 40, 50 years of sweat and blood, which we don't want to give to. And even the name will change. If it is now, say, Trivedi, it may become Shah after well, the, the in our son-in-law. Uh, demands the sharing property. So it's, there are so many economic, social, cultural, historical, uh, this thing, reasons, which also determine our practices, uh, tradition, customs, and actual practices. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the fruitful discussion. Uh, with the chair's permission, we can go for the vote of thanks. Yeah, please. Uh, I think can also yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Closing remarks by Professor Patel. Yeah. So I think today all three issues which uh, Plebia has raised, one is about the uh, work on the, the gender-based violence, which has been a long drawn struggle from 1980 till now. And uh, there also, I fully endorse that uh, laws have become stricter, but implementation is a very uh, important, very major challenge that people are facing at a grassroots level. And second, 498, when men's organizations have uh, the Pati Bachao Manch and all of they are also creating a lobbies. There are several judgments in which judges have made very, very, very uh, adverse statement about 498. But if you go through the data and the studies which Majlis has done, which shows that hardly 2% of men who people have been punished under uh, 498A. So that is also a very, very important concern. When it comes to judges training, what we have said is that uh, the, 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 the remarks which judges are making, and especially after that Madhya Pradesh High Court judge, you know, who had asked the rapist to marry the minor girl when she becomes that, that that created a major uproar and after that the achar samhita code of conduct for judges which what type of language to use what words to use what terminologies to use that also supreme court had come up with i think about that that is not much publicity it happened during the lockdown but i think we need to publicize this code of conduct for the judges which supreme court has prepared no that that is very important and the question of uniform civil code, I think it's a very, the, the democratic processes are very important. And Flavia is right when she said that 2018 law, uh, 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 the law commission, 21st law commission had involved women's group. There were comprehensive suggestions were given by the women's rights organization, lawyers, uh, and the process was far more participatory than suddenly. And now even we don't even have a draft. What, what the government is talking of UCC, where they have not even put the draft of the UCC. They have asked people's suggestion, but without any uh, base document. Even it is not that. That itself shows that how serious they are about this issue. And I think it is not a, a Hindu versus Muslim issue. It is a question of so many caste groups and community organizations, 650 tribal, uh, tribal groups in our country uh, who are uh, minorities like uh, Christians and uh, the uh, Buddhist and uh, Sikhs, they are also feeling 
quite uh, 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 insecure about what's going to happen when you have this whole UCC uh, backed by one rashtra, one, uh, one, one law, one nation uh, formula. No? So I think it's a very enlightening session we have had. And I think Empri has also circulated YouTube. So I think it is going to reach to thousands of people. Uh, already it is in circulation. The current talk debate is in circulation. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so we can go for the vote of thanks. Um, so much, yes, can I just, you know, uh, just a small uh, request. I just yeah. want to make, since ma'am has, uh, you know, uh, uh, views about marital rape, uh, you know, under the question of law, yeah. That is very important issue that we like, you know, somehow we have skipped it you know, during our whole course. So um, just, you know, uh, uh, for, you know, just uh, quickly give your views regarding that. Yeah. With the permission of Jeff. Yeah, so, yeah, please go ahead. But DV Act takes care of it. Yeah, but Flavia, please. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, I agree that is a very pressing issue. Uh, we have not legislated upon it. Every time it has come, uh, come up, they've been like... Uh, uh, barriers that are uh, drawn up and uh, finally uh, there's also oh, the whole question if 498 is causing so much distress then uh, this bringing in marital rape will uh, wreck families and etc uh, etc et all kind of, kind of fears that are being thrown out okay. um, uh, so many times it has come before the uh, legislature also before the supreme court also but uh, this exception to uh, husbands to have free sexual access to the wife should be taken out and whether the consent uh, is necessary. Now, there are judgments of the High Court and Supreme Court where they've said not having sex with your wife, not having sex with the husband uh, causes domestic violence. And on that ground, they have given divorce uh, to the husband. Uh, so uh, you wonder where you stand uh, regarding the uh, marital rape issue and there is no consensus here. Uh, but I agree with you that we need to look at it very seriously. And we need to bring in the suitable legislation to take away the exception given to husbands uh, that uh, after marriage, uh, he has free access to the wife. Uh, her consent should be of the primary importance and he cannot force himself upon her. And such judgment should go. There's, there cannot be such judgments on this issue. It's going to cause a lot of uh, churning. It's going to cause a lot of distress. And again, women are fighting false cases. How do you prove, et cetera, et cetera. And when do you give consent? When do you withdraw consent, et cetera? Uh, are issues that are uh, coming up uh, or will be raised once this uh, exception is taken out. But even so, the challenges you have to face. Uh, but this issue, uh, this exemption must be taken out for uh, for the male under section 376 of the rape law. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I guess there are no further questions, so we can go to the vote of thanks. Please go ahead. Yeah. As we come to the end of day 12 of the Law and Public Policy Youth Fellowship, an online national summer school program, a two-month online immersive legal awareness, an action research certificate training course, and internship program, I, Nikita Bhardwaj, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, would like to propose the for formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI New Delhi. We are grateful to our expert for the day 12 session, advocate Flavia Agnes, for taking out her valuable time and giving us an opportunity to learn from this online certificate program. We thank our prof chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, and lead advisor, advocate Dr. Shalu Negam, for convening the session. We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's celebration. We look forward to welcoming you Wednesday, that is 12th July at 11.30 a.m. for our 13th day of the certification course by distinguished experts, Mr. Devaditya Sinha, Professor Swaran Singh, and Advocate Dr. Shalu Nigam. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join in future to our MP, hashtag web policy talk and hashtag web policy learning. Wishing you a good day. Thank you.